Warren Green is a native of Gloversville and is retired from the Fulton County Probation Department. He has served his community in many other ways as well. His passion for nature dates back to his childhood, developed into shooting with slide film, and then he was faced with the difficult transition to digital photography. He presented wonderful images to us at the very time that he was fighting with digital back in 2016. Fortunately for everyone, he won the battle. <laughs> I am honored to welcome Warren Green on behalf of the Delaware at Siegel Audubon Society. Hi everybody, nice to be back. Um, first of all, I'm gonna have to figure out here which thing I push to go these, forward? This one or this one, right? These, these, this one and that one goes forward. Okay, this is forward. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, as you can tell, I'm not a IT guy, not at all. Uh, I'm also, just to be clear, I always like to be clear with this. I'll tell you what I'm not. I'm not an ornithologist. I'm not a biologist. I'm not an entomologist. I just pretend to be one once in a while. I am a pretty keen observer and I have been for my whole life of nature. So uh, with that, I have about 200 slides, okay? So we're gonna go through them relatively quickly. Anybody here into warblers? Any war warblers? Okay, because I do, my longest section is warblers. And so I'll kind of go through them, ba bing, ba bang, ba boom, until I get to a couple of hybrids. We'll talk about those a little bit, okay? So I brought this picture, the first one tonight, in honor of you guys. This is your 55th, right? Your 55th thing. And I, I noticed on the computer where you use the belted kingfisher uh, for your emblem. So that's for you. So we'll go on with my regular show. Let me see if I did this right. Uh, try it again. There. Okay, this is the only picture of something that's not wild, okay? This is a very close up of a snowy owl. And this is a fairly close up of a loon and something you should know, and I'm gonna show some more loon shots later. I'm a non-swimmer. I can't make it to this computer right here. Um, and so a friend of mine got me in a kayak twice. And let me be clear, those are the only two times I'm ever going to be in a kayak, believe me. So I thought this was kind of a neat shot of a red-winged blackbird on an extremely cold spring day. And it just showed by the breath. And here's a bluebird that doesn't look happy. He was right in my own backyard and it snowed the night before. And... This is what it came up with. <laughs> okay, so for the last couple of years, I've made a concerted effort to go after woodpeckers. I've been so busy going after warblers and that sort of thing. I kind of didn't go after these guys. So here's a section on warblers. This is a flicker. And this is a flicker at a nest at a friend's house. He owns an apple orchard. And he told me, Warren, you better come over. I got a flicker nest, believe it or not, at three feet high. So I set up a blind. Luckily, it's on his property. So I set up a blind and just left it there. So they got acclimated to it very quickly. So this is the male. This is the male flying out of the, of the nest. Leave it to me with my luck. The last two days, that they were in the nest before they fledged, it rained both days. So this is one of the days, but I went out anyways, didn't matter. And I went out. And so I was looking for a bright sunny day and I didn't get it. So that's at, here's the two on the day that they actually fledged. There were actually three of them. Uh, there was these two males and a female. The female lacks the black mustache. That's how you can tell them right away, the difference. Now, this one I'm putting up only because it actually, to me, is the most striking of all the uh, of all the woodpeckers. 
I'm searching around here because I think I have a, uh, oh yeah. Yes. This is a pileated woodpecker, a male. Um, this is just to show and to kind of prove they don't only eat just like ants and grubs and that sort of thing. They eat some fruits in the winter time as well. This is the female uh, also eating sumac right after a snowstorm. Now here's a male that had a grub, probably a grub of a of some kind of a beetle, I would guess. Here's one flying through the woods. And here's the male with two males. Um, everybody pretty familiar with pileated woodpeckers? Because, yeah, because the female um, does not have this red mustache. And also the red doesn't extend all the way down here. The red is only back here. And this is two male young, and this is about a week, believe it or not, before they actually left the nest. This is part of the woodpecker series. I got to tell you a quick story about this. This is Indian Lake, a sunrise on Indian Lake. And I was going up to a place called Bloomingdale. It's north of Saranac Lake. It's about three hours from my house because a guy I had met 35 years ago, and I won't tell you the whole story, it'll take the whole hour. Um, I found out I had a nest on his property and he invited me up. I went up six times in 11 days. This is one of the days I went up. This, I think, was the fourth time. And on my way home from this time, <laughs> it was about three o'clock in the afternoon and someplace just north of Speculator, I collided with the con of all male black bears. Uh, and I knocked him out colder than a mackerel, but he lived. And I had almost $5,000 damage to my car. So anyways, as we move along, I was up there to get a picture of this nest and it's kind of an uncommon nest to find. This is a black backed woodpecker. This is the female. And the next one is the male. The male, as you can see, has the, the yellow cap. Very tame bird, very tame. They nested at only five feet high. And they're a part of a family called three-toed woodpeckers. And you can see they just have the three toes instead of the usual four. This is the female adult with a female young. You say, well, it's got a little yellow. The, before they molt the first time, the females also have a little bit of yellow. Um, and you can see the nest itself has a bevel on the bottom. And supposedly that's probably there for an evolutionary purpose because with the three toes, it's easier to grab. This next shot is a male with a male young. You can see the male young has more of the yellow. Now the next shot <laughs> is, this is not the bear I hit, but he's, believe me, he's a close relative, a really close relative. And all I can say is after I hit him and he woke up and I looked at my car and I knew what the bill was going to be, we both felt the same way. Yes. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> moving along. Uh, just a few shots of another mammal that people don't see very often in, in the Adirondacks. This is a pine marten. I had known one was in this area and I went up, again, it's about a two and a half, three hour ride. I went up when it was dark. I got up there just before sunrise and I just walked out with my camera. I didn't even bring my tripod. I wish I had, but I just kind of walked out and all of a sudden I heard the scratching noise and I turned around and there were like three of them in this hole. And this guy was the last one. The others had already scampered away and I didn't see him really well, but this guy was there. So I just stood there and he kind of peered out a couple of times. And finally, I think he realized I wasn't a threat. So he went to come out. And once he decided to come out, he scampered right up the tree, but he gave me one last look. So again, this is a pine marten. Okay, um, 
about four or five years ago, I went on a trip to Machaya Seal Island. It's um, on the northernmost part of Maine. Um, and I'll tell you a sad story. Oop, oop, I'm sorry. I just went the wrong way. Went the wrong way. Let me go back. Okay. I hit something else. Um, a sad story is that the guy who had led trips on this, I, um, his name was Captain Andy for 30 years. He ended up getting killed this last spring. He he was a pilot, a, a self-pilot, you know, single plane, single person planes. And he crashed near Maryland, I guess. So I believe they still run the trips. But anyways, I went up there with a friend of this group, actually, Dave Keem. And we went up for two days, two full days. And we were lucky that both days we were able to get out there because he was the only boat that was allowed to land on the island. And uh, believe me, it's hard landing on the island because if the waves are too much, you can't really get on there. So anyways, these are some of the shots of the puffins. I thought these guys look like friends, you know, just buddies. Here's one about to take off. Here's one about to land. And the next picture, you know, everybody says, oh, they got kind of a clownish face. But you know, when you look at clowns, sometimes they look fun and sometimes they look kind of evil. Well, this is what a fish sees. I'm sure the little fish swimming around uh, weren't too happy with this guy. Okay, we'll turn over to herons. Um, this is a least bittern. Uh, this was shot in Stillwater, um, I guess that's Saratoga County, um, behind, this, behind their school district. There's a path, and sometimes you're lucky enough to find these guys. For people who haven't seen these before, this is the smallest heron, and they are extremely small for a heron. They're not much bigger than a robin, really. Um, the reason I have this thing here, this light, is to show you the next couple pictures. Okay, this is an American bittern. Here he is. You're looking at the underside. What they do is when they're afraid, their defense mechanism is to stand straight up in the reeds and just blend in with the background. And on a breezy day, they sway back and forth, just like the rest. So right up here is his eyes. Okay, we'll tell you the other. So I'm going to take one more shot at it. We'll go one more over. Now this one's on this side. Right? But it blends right in. Okay, now this is the bird. This this is the male. It's got its breeding plumage, those white epaulets. But it's a big bird, <laughs> actually. And here he is flying across the marsh. There's a black crowned night heron, uh, also in breeding plumage, those white strings like off the back of his head are plumes. Um, and he had three of them, which is really good. Sometimes they just have one. And the next shot is an interesting shot. I was on an overpass and the wind was blowing probably 55 miles an hour because when I was at this place for two days in a row it was gale force winds. Uh, this is going to be a yellow crowned night heron in full courtship display. But I was bracing myself against the bridge because I was being buffeted all around. What he did was he went down low in the vegetation so the wind wasn't catching him as much. So these are great egrets. When my dad was alive, um, his last couple of years, he lived in Delray Beach. And he kept telling me, Warren, you ought to come down here. You ought to come down here. There's a place called Watakahachi. You ought to go there. And so I finally got to go. And I went a few times, seeing my dad towards the end. And uh, boy, there are more birds there. You can kind of stick it, shake a stick at. Anyways, these are great egrets. This is a great blue heron. And everybody see the snake? And to me, it was like, you know, it was predator and prey. Usually you think of the snake being the predator, but this was the other way around. Okay, we'll get into some ducks. 
And my favorite duck around here that you see fairly often is wood ducks. So I'll have a group here of wood ducks. These are two drake wood ducks males that are pushing each other around to see who's the dominant one so you can win the affections of the female. But after they're done doing this, they usually take a bath. They dunk underwater. You've seen ducks dunk underwater and then they come up and they flap. So that's what this guy was doing. And here's the flapping routine. And then there's the male with the female. And the other one was just flying around, probably looking for another female. Uh, so it flew to another part of the pond and I was lucky enough to get it landing. In the meantime, the female is stuck in its nest for about a whole month. Um, they nest in holes in trees or wood duck boxes, that sort of thing. I was in a blind six straight days, three hours a day to get three shots. This was the best of the shots. It never showed itself, although I knew it was in there. Um, it was just incubating. But on the last day, when they hatch, they're only in there for a day. And then they jump out. The female's calling them, and they jump out, and they follow the female right to a near, nearby body of water. So this is a shot of the young. And I love this. I took hundreds of shots of this thing. These two right here, I can almost see them talking to each other saying, let him go first and see if he lives. You know? <laughs> okay, this is a northern shoveler. I just thought this was an interesting look at it, you know, straight on like this. Looked like for the old timers here, Jimmy Durante with the big nose. That's what this thing reminded me of. This is a buffle head that I actually caught in perfect light. Um, normally their heads look more black, but when the light hits it just right, it's like this. Um, I go fishing every year with a friend of mine on the Niagara River in either February or March for steelhead. And when we walk down to the dock, boy, sometimes there's some nice ducks that get in there uh, to get out of the waves and everything of the Niagara River. This is one of those times. <clears throat> this is another time I was out on the Niagara. He caught this common golden eye. What's that? Yes. Yep. We're about eight miles below Niagara Falls. So it's like heading out towards Lake Ontario. That would be right below the falls. Right. This is now called a long-tailed duck. It used to be called an old squaw for people who know this duck. This is also on the Niagara River. This is a red-breasted merganser. You would think this would be on a big body of water because that's where they normally live. But actually, I caught this one in migration at a friend of mine's pond. It looks like it's a big body of water, but it was only because it was a very windy day. Bad, bad hair day for him, too. <laughs> now, here's a dominance fight over the female. Uh, these two males were both trying to win the affection of the female. And even though to my eye, the one on the left looks like it should be the dominant one, the one on the right is the one who won. Okay, as I said, I'm a non-swimmer. And I mean, I am a really non-swimmer. I was a non-swimmer before I had hip replacement surgery, but I've had three hip replacement surgeries. So I got more metal in me than... God. And so I, you know, I'm not a swimmer. A friend of mine has supposedly an unsinkable kayak. It's a fishing kayak. I refer to it as the Titanic. <laughs> but anyways, he, get, he got me into it twice. And so these are a series of shots of loons from that kayak. Now, this is a loon. This is the male, I presume. The chicks were on the back of the other one. This guy was fishing. So he's looking down, seeing when he sees something. And when he does, he goes and gets it. 
then he presents it to one of the chicks. And then later, they're still on the back of what I presume is a female, and he's bringing a slightly bigger fish. And then he goes and he gets a bigger fish. <laughs> this is later in the year, so the, the chick is a little bigger. So he got this bigger fish, and then <laughs> he caught a fish that was way too big. Uh, it was way too big. And what he ended up doing was he ended up beating it on the water until it finally died, and he swallowed it whole. And then there's the family kind of going away. So we'll go to that. Switch up from the birds for a minute, and I'll take you through some, yeah, just some nice shots of uh, some orchids, wild orchids in the Adirondacks. These are showy lady slippers. These are pink lady slippers. I think they're pretty common, pretty familiar. This is a ram's head lady slipper, which is a very tiny flower and very, very uncommon. The flower itself is probably no bigger than my thumbnail, but it is one of the uh, lady slippers. This is a yellow lady slipper. Am I doing good standing right here? I'm supposed to stand right here. I'm a wanderer usually. I feel like walking someplace. I can't <laughs> for the Zoom people. There's a dragon mouth. Um, it's called Arethusa is the real name. But it's called dragon mouth because of that lower petal. This is uh, Calipogon, otherwise known as grass pink. In a lot of the bogs in the Adirondacks, you'll see quite a few of these. The best place and the most beautiful ones I've ever seen isn't, isn't this one, actually. It's um, in Paul Smith's. Anybody know Paul Smith's? There's a college, Paul Smith's. Behind Paul Smith's, there's the Vic. Um, uh, and they have paths, a couple of paths down there. And on one of the paths, when you go down, there's orchids everywhere. It's really a beautiful spot. If I was going to go, I'd go eh, early July, I guess, would be the best. There's a rose begonia. This is purple fringed orchid. And you know, you don't get the feeling of just how ornate each of the flowers is until you see it close up. And likewise, this is the flower stalk of what's called the large leafed. Here we'll go backwards again here. This is the large leafed orchid, um, the large round leafed orchid, I'm sorry. And when I saw this, I saw this and I thought, boy, it looks just like a face. So I went to this and it looks just like an alien to me. <laughs> And from that, I'm going to go to small birds. We'll start out with a hummingbird, ruby-throated hummingbird female, getting nesting material. Now, the next shot is about a 30 years old that I shot on film and I had switched over so I could show it now. This is a hummingbird with its young on a nest. This is the only hummingbird nest that I've actually found that's low, that was low enough for me to easily get some shots. And... Uh, this was my favorite one of that group. And the next shot is the male ruby-throated hummingbird. He, I was back at this place to take pictures of uh, warblers. There were these pine woods and this was an opening in the pine woods and there were wildflowers growing. And this guy kept landing on the same spot over and over and over again to force out other hummingbirds. That was his territory, he was gonna keep it. He was dive bombing everybody. So I thought, you know, I gotta keep looking for these warblers and getting bit up by a million black flies. I ought to take something I can actually shoot. So I took the shot of him. Okay. This is gonna start the group of warblers and I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly, okay? Because I started late to try to get out of here for everybody. So I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. <clears throat> One thing you should know though, Boy, this really holds true with warblers. You know, people think of territory two-dimensionally. They think, well, if there's one here, there won't be another bird nesting for a long way over there. It's also vertically. Um, you could have warblers, you could have like a Blackburnian warbler nesting 50, 60 feet high. Then you can have a black-throated green warbler nesting 20 feet high. 
And then on the ground, right on the same tree, you could have a black and white warbler. So territory and, you know, it takes three dimensions to really look. So this is a yellow warbler. These are all males, by the way. These are all males in breeding season in the spring. Okay, this is the male uh, yellow warbler. This is the male yellow throat warbler, common yellow throat, I should say, common yellow throat. This is a yellow rumped warbler. This is a black throated green. And this is the black throated blue. This is the only warbler that doesn't look like a warbler that I brought today. This is a, a northern water thrush. But I kind of like the whole habitat surrounding. This is a prairie warbler. Chestnut sided. Canada warbler. They're known the necklace. And the necklace is highly variable. Sometimes you just get a few things. Sometimes it's almost black. There's so much. This is kind of an in-betweener. Oh, switch on its own. This is a Nashville warbler. They're known for that eye ring. They're kind of a plain looking bird, but they have they do have that eye ring. This is a palm warbler. You can see how attentive he is. That's because there were three males all in the same spot. They were all kind of vying around for whose territory it was going to be. They're known, they're one of the first warblers that come up, up here. They flick their tails constantly. This is a magnolia warbler. To my eye, for me, uh, they're kind of emblematic of what I think of a, as a warbler. Um, they have the four colors that I think of in a warbler. They have black, white, gray, and yellow. And in most warblers, northern water thrush being one of the ex exceptions, most of warblers have at least one of those colors, if not more. This is the Blackburnian warbler, probably the most striking, I think, of all the warblers when you get a good look at them. Um, the next one is him again. It looks like he was calling back to me, but he wasn't. He was sitting on the branch for a minute, and as I was shooting him, he just kind of opened his jaw as if he was realigning his jaw for a second. And I just was lucky enough I was shooting at that moment. So... Did anybody guess the name of this one? <laughs> Black and white warbler. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, they didn't have to go too far with that name. This is the northern Perula warbler. This is the smallest of the warblers from, oh, I would say probably from there to there. It's probably about five and a quarter inches. This is the American red start. Uh, this is a prothonotary warbler. They're the only warbler that I know of that New York State nests in holes in trees. Maybe there's another one. I don't know. But they nest in holes in trees or in cavities. Uh, they're usually found around really swampy areas. Um, one place you can find them is a place called Armitage Road. It's part of Montezuma. There, there's other places, especially in southern New York, but that's the place that I'm most familiar with. This is a cerulean warbler hunting. This is in a place some of you may know, Doodletown. Anybody know Doodletown? Doodletown, yeah. Uh, I was in Doodletown, and this guy was hunting, and I got a good shot. And the next shot is really a good shot because they're a real treetop dweller. So it's hard to get them at fairly eye level. This one was a little higher than eye level, but believe me, I was more than satisfied that I was able to get this. This was a really unusual one. This is a Kentucky warbler. That it was also a doodle town about four or five years ago. I was actually there with Dave Keem. And he had heard there was one there. And so we went wandering around and we were shooting. Da, 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 and we went up this trail where we heard there was one. And all of a sudden, this little yellow bird comes in, lands right next to us. It's right next to us. And Dave goes, Oh my God, that's a Kentucky Warbler. And I turned and I shot bang, 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 bang. And by the time Dave turned, he was gone. So one of us was a happy camper, <laughs> the other one wasn't. <laughs> this is a hooded warbler also same place uh, at Doodletown 
This is a bay-breasted warbler. This is um, near me. It's just outside of Albany. This is a Cape May warbler. This is also near me during migration. They don't nest here, this one or the last one. They don't nest around here. Um, they go far, further up into Canada. To me, uh, this guy has turned out to be the most photogenic to me of all the warblers. It's just, he's got so many things going on, that orange blotch on his head and the striping and, and everything. Okay, this is a three-parter. This Tennessee warbler, I was in a blind at a favorite spot of mine where some warblers funnel through the first week or two of May. And as they were funneling through and I was getting some shots, all of a sudden this Tennessee warbler came in. I could see he was hunting. He was hunting all the way in. And he landed on this branch. And can you see this webbing? That webbing meant something was in there. He bent down to grab it. Sure enough, he got it. Then he flew off. Anybody know this one? Worm-eating warbler. Wait. They call them worm-eating warblers. They don't actually go after worms, but they are a ground kind of uh, bird. They they just like a uh, like a sparrow would. It kind of scratches around in the leaves and gets whatever it can get. Anybody? This is a black pole warbler. I took this on the top of um, Whiteface Mountain. The thing that's really interesting about these guys, to me anyways, is you see his shoulders? They look like thicker, kind of bigger, more powerful than the other warblers. This guy is probably the greatest flyer of all the songbirds. He, When he migrates, they've shown studies where they've gone from Canada to Argentina and in three days without stopping. They just keep flying along the Atlantic seaboard and they just keep right on going. And it's funny when you see them live in person and you see them fly between branches, you can see it's different. It's a different flight style. Anyways, when I was up there taking pictures of it, one time it was this guy actually flew to a branch and was grabbing something. He was kind of far away from me, but I shot it anyways. I knew it was grabbing something to eat. Later, I cropped the heck out of it, did it close up, and here it is. And what I thought was this beetle or whatever it is, it's going the wrong way. It's 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 like going down his throat. I'm thinking to myself after seeing this picture, turn around, you know, <laughs> you're going the wrong way. Okay, this is going to start a little thing that's really interesting to me. This is a golden winged warbler that to me was like a myth for years um but the golden winged and the next shot the blue winged warbler their dna is 99.7 or 8 percent the same which leads to a lot of interbreeding the blue winged this one is the dominant bird so when a when a blue winged and a golden wing pure of each mate it comes out with what's called a brewster's warbler so here's the Brewster's warbler, and here's another look at one. Now, if the Brewster's warbler then back crosses and mates with one or the other, and they're the pure ones, then you come up with what's called a Lawrence's warbler. It's, it's very uncommon, but this is the Lawrence's warbler. I think I have another picture, this one. So this is the Lawrence's warbler, and in between, all those, when you have some that have mated and then they mate with others and they mate with others, sometimes you just get some, you, they just have elements of everything in there. They look really strange. But these ones that I showed you, the Lawrence's and the Brewster's are sort of pure Lawrence's and Brewster's. We'll go to some butterflies really quickly. This is a tiger swallowtail. This is a chrysalis. I happened to see it, you know, when I was walking around of a monarch. It's on aster in the fall. This is a painted lady butterfly. This is from the underneath and this is from the top. In some of my bio, you might've read, my first love when I was a little kid, I love butterflies and moths. 
then I kind of graduated to uh, reptiles and amphibians. So <laughs> anyways, this is a Baltimore checker spot. The underside is much nicer than the top. So I didn't even take it from the top. And the next four moths I'm going to show you are the big silkworm moths. The interesting thing about them is as caterpillars are voracious eaters, they eat all year long, right up until the fall. But as adults, they don't have a mouth part. They don't eat at all. They live for about a week. They live long enough to mate and then they die or they get eaten by a bird. Anyways, this guy, the Cecropia, across from here to here is about six inches. So it's much bigger it's much bigger than the uh, than the warblers that I showed you. This is a Promethea moth, a male. This is all in that same group. There's a Polyphemus. And the last one is a Luna. This was my favorite as a kid. This is the Luna. And from there, I think where I'm taking you is, I'll call them the Dirty Dozen. I got about a dozen shots of birds that are either interesting or they're in an interesting position or something. Everybody see this guy? Yeah, some people said yes, some people know. Right here, this is his eye, that's his beak, that's his tail. This is a whippoorwill. That's a whippoorwill on its nest. This shot was taken about 30 years ago. And since I'll never find another whippoorwill nest, I figured I'd better show that one. This is a Bicknell's thrush, which I think to a lot of people, it was a big find. It was up on top of Whiteface when I was shooting the black pole warbler. This guy just happened to fly in. I wasn't even after him. He flew in. It just looked like any other thrush to me. And all of a sudden, it hit me. Oh, my God. I think that's a big nose thrush. And he was calling, and there was another one calling a little farther away. And I turned. I was in my car at this point, so it made a perfect blind. And bang, 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 bang. And there he is. This is a fox sparrow. I brought this one because sparrows get that bad thing. You know, when you see them fly across the street, they're an LBJ, you know, a little brown job. That's all anybody calls them. But when you see them close up, boy, some of the sparrows are really beautiful. And this one is usually right on the ground. So I was lucky to get it up on a branch. This is a marsh wren in the classic position of marsh wrens. These are purple martins. The thing that's unusual about this was when I was in New Jersey, uh, it was 55 mile an hour winds and it was 40 degrees. And they're, they're insect eaters. They eat them on the wing. Well, there were no insects and they had to stay warm. And so they all came down to the edge of this parking lot and huddled together. This is only one group of a bigger mass actually. And I thought, boy, what a neat looking shot that is. So. I drove up as close as I could without scaring him and took took the shot. This is the Oriole, Baltimore Oriole. This is a Baltimore Oriole with nesting material, the female. This is the Scarlet Tanager. You can't get the reds right on these computers. It's unbelievable. Anyway, this is an indigo bunting. Okay. This is a uh, bobolink. And what's interesting about this is they're a seed eater, except after the young hatch. Then they catch insects to feed the young. Well, they hadn't quite hatched yet. But this fly or whatever it was kept flying around this bird. And I could see him looking at it like, should I or shouldn't I? Should I or shouldn't I? He didn't in the end. He flew away. But he could have if he wanted to. OK, these are cedar wax wings. I just like the whole kind of look to the shot. These are blue jays. This stick was set up by a bird feeder of mine. Um, and they there were about five of them around. They were always trying to get to the top. All of them were trying to get to the top to be the dominant bird. So you see the one on the top. The one below is trying to get them off of there. And all I'm thinking is the one on the top is looking down at him and saying, give me a breath mint, will you please? And this is, I still call them gray jays, but they're known as Canada jays. And they're just the reverse of the, of the blue jay. The blue jay is sort of like 
always a little wary and a little this and the other thing. This guy is as mild and calm as you can get. And if you hold out a piece of bread, they fly right to your hand. They fly right to your hand and take it right off your hand. Okay, I'll go to some finches quickly. And this is a pine grosbeak. And you can always see that stuff on its beak because they eat the seed inside of those, uh, those fruits. And so they just chew through the fruit to get to see. So it's always that stuff on them. And sometimes you see them getting these really oddball positions <laughs> to try and grab them. And I think this is really a good shot of an oddball position. This is an evening gross beak. And the reason I brought this one is because of the next two I'm going to show you of the evening gross beak. In the winter, the gross beak's beak is yellow. But this last year, they stayed a long time, longer than they usually do when they come down. And what I noticed was their beaks turned to greenish. And in the next shot, you'll see the female. You can see it's really greenish. And that's one of the things that shows it's, it's in breeding season. This is a rose-breasted gross beak. I guess in the old days, you used to call them cutthroats. Look at somebody cut their throat, the blood came down. Two years ago, we had a big influx of crossbeak, crossbills. There's red crossbills and white wing crossbills. This is a male red crossbill. They almost act like parrots. And they use that crossbill to insert the bill into a pine cone uh, to the scales. And then they pry it open with their tongue. They take the seed. And this is the female red crossbill. And this is the male. They come down to roads early in the morning in the winter and they lick up salt and sand because it helps their gizzards chew up the pine seeds. This is the white wing crossbill. This is the female white wing crossbill. This is an interesting three shot series. Gotta watch this. You see this uh, the plant on the left. You see the, the branch it's looking at, right? It's got seeds on it and it's really hungry. There weren't too many around. So he's looking, he's just about to take it and wham, from out of nowhere, another one comes in and they start fighting and they go off to the side. And as they're off to the side, a horned lark came in and took the seeds. Okay, I'll go through some game birds real fast. This is a um, ring neck pheasant. This is a rough grouse. This is a very rare spruce grouse. This was taken in a place called Spring Pond Bog many years ago. I don't think there's any there anymore, but there is a place called Blue, I think it's Blue Mountain Road that's up above uh, Paul Smith's. It's, it's on the way to Madawaska. Uh, they, they, supposedly there are some there. These are just a pair of tom turkeys. They looked like they were good friends, good buddies. So I took a shot of them. And we'll go to some raptors. This is a Cooper's hawk, which unfortunately had come in and was camping out near a bird feeder that I had set up. So whatever. This is a Merlin. And a Merlin is a, is a bird eater also. And in this case, it's got one. Anybody know what the other bird is? Because I don't. Yeah. Take a shot at it. I thought maybe it was a junco, but I I don't know. I came across it when it was sort of looking like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> sure does. Okay, this is a jur falcon. This jur falcon. Sorry, peregrine falcon. Uh I'm looking actually down off a cliff at it. And this is the female, which is a much bigger, stockier bird than the male. And he's looking up at me. She's looking up at me like, what the hell? I went back about two weeks later uh, to see if I could get a shot of it in flight. And as I was climbing up the cliff along a ridge, all of a sudden I realized I saw something moving on my right-hand side. And when I realized what it was, it was a juvenile. It had just fledged and it was coming up the side of the cliff and so I laid down. 
And he was doing all kinds of things. And I finally, I chickened out. I said, I got to take him now. I, I can't wait for anything else. And as soon as I shot him a couple of times, he heard the click and he looked right at me. And we're looking at each other. And I took a couple more shots and then he kind of flew back down the side. But this is the one shot I got. Okay, this is an adult and a juvenile uh, bald eagle. You can see on the bald eagle, the, the adult, he's got a band. Unfortunately, I wish he didn't have a band, but he does. Uh, they were fighting over a deer carcass, which was down here, just out of the picture. The, the adult was on it, and the juvenile had come in to take it. And they came into some fight. I thought this was the best of the positions I got. Okay, we'll go to the late summer and fall shots. I always think of like late August, early September, you see fog and dew and everything. And I think of sp seeing spider webs early in the morning. And then I think of raindrops on some of the leaves that have fallen. And of course, milkweed pods. And then there's some frost, frost on the pumpkin, in this case, frost on the oak. And again, in September-ish, you get those cloudy, rainy days, and then the sun comes out and goes back and forth. And sometimes you're lucky to get a rainbow. And sometimes as you're hiking, you see things like, wow, boy, that's interesting, you know? In this case, this is partway up a mountain called Goodno Mountain near North Creek. You go up to the fire tower and about halfway up, this presents itself. It's like, I don't know what you'd call this, but I, there's got to be one name for it somewhere. Not octopus. It's like survival or something, you know, one of those. This is just a scene that I kind of liked. It was kind of misty, foggy. This is on your way into a place called Elk Lake, off of, uh, it's on in North Hudson. This is the pond, whatever you want to call it back here. It's a lake. That's clear pond. It's a uh, glacial, a small glacial lake. This is an interesting place. Um, this is on the Sacanaga River, and I go here every year because every year at 835 <laughs> uh, in the morning, the sun is hitting the far side, but the sun hasn't come up enough to hit the water. And so because the water is in a shadow, there's no reflection from the sun. And so the color just explodes on the water. And so I, I walk up and down this little stretch to get different angles. So this is an angle I took this year just a couple of weeks ago. So I brought this. Mm -hmm. This shot, I just walked down this embankment with a wide angle lens, get this. This is also the Saginaga River. This is just, you know, when I was walking around and seeing things, this is one of the things I saw. Okay, this is Elk Lake, and this is before sunrise. And I got in the water. I, you know, my feet are probably still frozen from three years ago when I took this <laughs> shot. I got behind the dock, and I just kind of shot with a wide angle lens. Here's the same lake, this is Elk Lake taken a little later that morning. And at this point, I just walked out into the lake and tried not to slip on the rocks, you know, because they're so algae. This is from Sunrise Mountain in the Elk Lake Preserve, and that's Clear Pond. Remember earlier I showed a picture of Clear Pond? This is what Clear Pond looks like from Sunrise Mountain looking down. Everybody know Chapel Pond on Route 73 going off the north way towards Lake Placid. This is a piece of Chapel Pond that's, as you're facing Chapel Pond from the road, it's on the far left. And at about 10.15 to 10.45 in the morning, the sun comes up high enough where it just skirts the back of those uh, cliffs and just hits the trees. Believe it or not, this is early December. It looks like the spring to me, but it's early December, just an unknown stream. I just kind of look like the look of the rocks. 
This is a sunrise after a, a really a freak snowstorm that happened a few years ago on Thanksgiving night. And so this was the morning. And I just had the feeling there was going to be something here. So with the sunrise, you can also get sunsets. This is in the middle of summer, of course. And the next shot, as it's getting darker, you can go out and get night skies. I'm not an astrophotographer, but every once in a while, I feel like getting out. And um, this was a few years ago when the comet Neowies was right, right? You all heard of Neowies. And believe me, when you looked at Neowies, you could hardly see the doggone thing. You had to be out in the dark for half an hour to get your eyes activated to even see where it was in the night sky. So if you use the right technique and everything, you can finally get it and then enhance it somewhat in the computer. And so that's what I came up with. That was Neowies. And in my last series of shots, I think of nighttime, I think of birds, or, you know, the birds that you see at night, and it's these guys. This is a gray-phased screech owl. For everybody to see it, it's right here, right? And the next one is a red-phased screech owl. They're the same bird. For some reason, I don't think science really knows why well, some are red, some are gray. The red ones tend to be farther south, the gray ones farther north, but it doesn't seem to always hold true. This is also a screech owl. It's kind of almost an in-between phase a little bit, but it had taken over this wood duck box. This is up near Hudson Falls. This is a sawwood owl taken about 30 years ago, and I have a great little short story to tell with this one. Uh, my dad always wanted to take a ride with me someplace back in the day when I went birding and I said, dad, I'm going to a place called Braddock Bay. It's like a two and a half hour ride. It's above Rochester. I said, I've seen solid owls there. I usually can find one maybe if I'm lucky and I'm going to take a ride. If you want to go, we can go there and then we can go to Syracuse. He had a favorite restaurant there on the way back. He says, I'll take a ride. So we went up and we walked back and there were seven of them. And there were in one spot, you could see like three or four of them at the same time. It looked like Christmas ornaments. I'm like, and my father must have thought, this is easy. You know, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> right. So anyways, this is one shot. Of... This was the luckiest shot I ever got. This is a boreal owl. John Lowe's here. He remembers this. This is the same bird on the same branch from a totally different angle. I was on my way home from jury duty. And where that um, bird feeder is, uh, by the edge of that orchard where I said, you know, the hawks come in. I, mean, I was going up there and I had a pair of boots and I was going to throw some bird seed in the bird feeder. It's already three in the afternoon in February. It's getting dark already. It was a cloudy day. I'm going up the road, this little dirt road, and all of a sudden I see this tiny owl on this branch overhanging the ditch. And I thought, oh my God, it's a solid owl. That's what I'm saying to myself. And so I turned around and ran home about 70 miles an hour on a 35 mile an hour road, got my camera, came back and I thought, he'll never be there, he'll never be there, he'll never be there. It's already kind of starting to get dark. And he was there and I was like, oh my God. And so I drove up and I got as close as I dared get. And that's when I got this shot. And I thought, I wonder what it looks like from the other side. So then I drove up a little more and I turned back. And this was my first year having digital. So I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So I shot him from this side and I got back to my house and I was all psyched and I got him in the computer and I sent it right out to my best friend, a guy named Brian. And I said, Brian, look what I got. I got a saw it all. I got a saw it all. He says, you dummy, that's a boreal owl. I said, it can't be a boreal owl. They're not around. He said, he said, I'm telling you that's a boreal owl. And sure enough, it ended up being a boreal owl. So this is a Northern Hawk owl. This was taken in Vermont. This is him again. This is in a spot where you couldn't take a step without voles running around. And so he was in there for about five weeks. This is a few years ago. There's a burrowing owl and it's got that interesting face because I was there on probably the only day that is cold in Florida and wet. So what could I do? You know, I had to go out and find something. So this guy was in a place called Brian Piccolo Park your Hollywood, Florida, if I remember. And so 
I saw several different nests. And I saw this guy right near the side of the road. I got out of my car. I laid down. And it's just drizzle, this cold drizzle. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm cold in Florida. And all of a sudden, he just did this shake, almost like he was taking a bath. And then he turned at me and was like, what are you doing here? And that's, that's this look. This is a short-eared owl over the grasslands of uh, Washington County. And this next shot, I swear I got to send to DEC someday. I think they would want this. This is a barred owl. I think this is a first year bird. This is really odd. I was walking through the woods and he followed me. And every time I'd stop, this went on for 45 minutes. And he just kept following me and following me. And I kept hearing two or three of them calling from fairly close proximity, but I never actually saw them. But this guy just kept coming and coming and would land all around me. And so this is one of those shots. This is just a shot of one in a snowstorm, not the same one, obviously. This is a snowy owl, if you, you can see <laughs> the wind whipping across here. I don't think my battery's working anymore. It was so windy and I'm walking up the slight incline and it was so cold. And I'm thinking, he looks like he's in Miami Beach. I look, I, I feel like I'm dying here. I can't even go any farther. And I took a few pictures and this was one of them. This is the whitest one I've ever seen. It was near Lowville. I, I couldn't get very close to him. Um, he wouldn't allow it. He would fly away. Sometimes you get pretty close, not this guy. This is a, a male. Now here's a real juvenile. And he hid behind this pile of manure <laughs> in a farmer's field. And the wind was coming from the right. So it blocked some of the wind. And the manure is probably still warmer. And so he just settled right in there. There's one flying. It's like fly the friendly skies, you know. And this next shot is actually, I, I thought the, my nicest shot of a snowy owl, although it wasn't in a regular spot. It wasn't like on a hummock or anything. It was on this, it was a fence post, a fake fence post that a guy had put up on Wolf Island, which is on the northern part of Lake Ontario, just over the Thousand Island Bridge. If you look that up, Wolf Island. And for my last bird, I have the great gray owl, which is the biggest owl by volume anyways, in North America. Some of these were taken in Messina and some of them were taken in Keene Valley a few years ago. Here he had hopped off the branch, went to go get something. And here's the one in Keene, in Keene. He was at a place near called Bark Eater. It was a restaurant or place to stay. And every afternoon he would course over those fields. And if, if you remember how I started the show, I, I actually started it with the white owl, the snowy owl. I'll end it with, this is the great gray owl stare. Except this one is a real wild one. Okay, so I thank you all very much. Hope you enjoyed it. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask for any questions or if we're running out of time. Are there any questions? Yeah. The Myrtle bird. Well, it is Myrtle. Yeah. It, yeah. Yep. Yep. Anybody else? Listen, I'm almost 72 years old. You know, it's hard to keep up with all these names. You know, the woman out there. Whoop. Okay. The kind of camera I use is a Nikon. D850, it's 46 megapixels, so it allows for quite a bit of cropping. And I use a 500 millimeter lens that I generally hand hold. Um, back in the day when I shot film, I don't think I ever took a picture without a tripod. Now it's probably 50-50, okay? Yeah, anybody, the VR, it's called VR, vibration reduction that they have now really helps you hand hold. And listen, I got two fake hips. I got a bum knee. I got a I got a bunion the size of a small Volkswagen. Uh, so, uh, luckily for me, back in the day, and I still have it. Um, I have very good eye hand coordination, so that's still with me. I don't know how long that's going to go, but I still have that at least. So it makes it easy for me to hand hold.
Anybody else? Nope, seeing none. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.